I'm sad. I'm sad. Too. Because they were so boring. Today, it gave like a pageant show. It gave a week one performance. This gave oh. audition tape, girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to be a legend? A statement, a statement, a star. Did you want to be a legend? What's up, everyone, and welcome back to The Let Out, a legendary podcast. I'm your host, Michael Street. It's now episode eight of the season, and the competition is getting a little chilly. This week, Houses participated in the Winter Wonderland Ball that was packed with three categories. In the first, each put on an all-house production featuring poses and dips. Just like last week, the House of Miyaki Mugler gave us everything. Storyline, choreography, energy. It was a chilling performance that got them tens across the board for the second time this season. The second category was Three Fab Mice, which essentially is synchronized runway. This night, the steps just were not on point, and the only house that ended up with tens was Miyaki Mugler. For the third category, the houses competed in the category of face. While we didn't get the battle that I personally wanted to see, which was Shannon Balenciaga versus Stasha Garçon, it was a hot category with Kalik Balenciaga pulling out the win. At the end of the night, the house of Miyaki Mugler ended up with a superior house trophy, again. Sadly, it was the house of Orichi that went home. Here with us today, we have the house's founding father and mother, Omari Orichi and Gillette Orichi, to talk about their time on the show. This is the road to legendary, honey. This is what it takes. It's a new house. We're a new yeah. entity. And it's kind of our advantage. We have this mysterious kind of play. And unlike other houses, we are bringing fresh faces to the scene. Hey, Omari, how are you? Hey, what's up? I'm doing good. How are you? Good, good. What about you, Gillette? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good, good. So I want to hop into it. I just watched the last episode, and coming into it, everyone was really sort of reeling off of the the previous episode where Tishi went home and Omari had that amazing battle. And so I just actually wanted to sort of start with talking about Omari, what was it like coming into this episode and having gotten all that feedback from the judges and, and everyone, really? Um, this episode was really tough. You know, it was for me, I didn't want my house to go home. You know what I'm saying? They, I didn't want any of us to feel like we didn't put our best out there. So when I had to battle, I just was like, I have to put everything my all into it. You know, it was um, it was scary because I know how good Simone is as well, too, as a performer. But I know a lot of people underestimate me, too, as well as a performer. So I think I just really needed to let go and and not think about the stage, but just think about like being safe and being present and being, you know, there for my house. Did you guys feel like you guys came in uh, to this episode as a result of that, like wanting to prove something or wanting, obviously wanting to do better, but, you know, did, was there any of that kind of energy coming into, you know, this ball? Yeah, we came into it with like, because the judges, like their critiques, we really listen to the judges' critiques and we try to bring um, or step up you know, what we have to. So I think for me personally too, I was too much into my head about what the judges wanted us to do. And I kind of let that get away as well. So I felt like, you know, I needed to, again, through the battle, I, it was my fault and I needed to get us, you know, to the next week. With the All House performance, obviously everyone was talking about Gillette. You came in on your skates, which I loved going skating when I was younger, so it was, it, it was fun to see that. Uh, but like, can you talk to me about the decision to include that? Uh, are you a big skater, or or where did that sort of come from? So um, I'm not a professional skater. Actually, my first job, I was a skate guard at a skating rink, and you know, we was there for like a while, and we. You know, sometimes I had downtime and I was watching Home Alone and I saw him like skating through the um, hotel. So I purchased some skates and, 
you know, I just took my skates outside and was skating and stuff. And they like saw me skating. They was like, you should might add, add it in your production. So we made it work. So I'm not a professional skater. <laughs> we made it work. <laughs> this is something you basically just like kind of picked up again as a result of the show. Yeah, I was just trying to have fun, you know, make, you know, make the best of, you know, the situation, so. Well, then after, you know, skating into the production, you had to face off against Stasha in the category of face, which is kind of a lot. I absolutely would not have wanted to do that. But had you walked face before? Uh, and, and how was that? So um, I haven't walked face in like the ballroom mainstream, but in the Kiki scene, I have walked face before. My whole thing with walking face while being there was Stasha's here. Like, I gotta, like, it's, it's me or Stasha. <laughs> so I even said that when we did the best dress, like, the only person that I was worried about was Stasha. Um, and when it came to battling her, and when we was backstage, I saw what she... I was like, Miss Mama looks so fast. Like, <laughs> girl, you got to care. I was like, you got to carry. But it was such an honor. I had fun. Like, I didn't expect going into it to win. I was grateful for what votes I did get, you know, with her. But, um... Yeah, it was fun, and I had fun walking face. It might be something new for Gillette. You never know. <laughs> I thought it was great. You look good. Yeah, you you looked amazing. You look so good. Thank you. So good. Um, obviously, Omari. Then the episode sort of ended with your battle, and I wanted to just hear your thoughts about going into that battle, and then even about what the judges had to say, sort of after going into the battle. Um, I was ready. I was ready. This was like, okay, let's do this. It was really interesting when Demi Lovato like said that she didn't see the passion in my performance and that she felt it more in the House of Garçon. And I just was like, man, I'm really, I'm really putting it out there. Like I'm, I'm not just trying to like vogue. I felt like the same energy that I did from my previous battle from being in the bottom. Yeah. That pushed me to want to like make it through, you know? And I felt like our performance was stronger as well too as a unit. So I just was like, I, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna let this, you know, happen. Mm -hmm. But that kind of got to me. And Megan's comment as well, like saying that she wished that she would have, I would have sent someone else out or seen someone else. That kind of stuck with me after the competition because I always felt like, well, man, what if I would have sent out someone else, you know, in replace of that? As a leader, that makes you those type of comments. So that makes you think. It was really interesting to just go through that and really put everything out there in battle and then just to get those type of comments. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting what Megan was saying because I think it sort of comes from two different perspectives, right? I think that like, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seemed for, for you, you felt like as a father and the leader of the house that you had to go out and sort of defend the house and like do those sorts of things because that's what a leader should do is they should sort of make the sacrifice for themselves and be on the front lines in that way. Um, and it seemed to me that what Megan was saying is it's, she wasn't even interpreting it in that way so much, so much as she was receiving it as like, Omari, we know that you can Vogue, but we need to know that there's talent elsewhere in the house. And so it seemed like you were, instead of protecting them, to me, I interpreted it as like, she saw it as you were carrying them, right? Um, so I, I just, that's how I re received it. And I didn't know if you, how you were thinking about it. No, that's exactly how I felt. And I was like, no, man, the, every member in this house puts in their work. Every member in this house holds up their own weight, you know, but also giving the, the people that we have on the team, besides myself and Remy, you know, to get out there and, and battle, that's that's the two. It's a competition. That's the two people we have on our team to be able to get out there and take that win. So again, I, I felt like I just was ready. I was in the moment. And again, it, it, it yeah, I felt like she definitely took it a different way. And, and again, like everyone on my team, they are extremely talented. They can get out there. Even if I would, I mean, honestly, even if I would have sent out Karma to get out there and battle like the old way, his talent is amazing to where I know that he would have took that win home within his style, you know, so it definitely was hurtful. So I know a little bit about how the House of Orichi started, but for everyone else, can you guys explain a little bit about when and how? And from my recollection, you guys are the founding parents, so you, there's no one better to, to explain this. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> Omar, you want to go first? Um, sure. I'll, I'll start it. Um, I was in Brazil at the time, and um, there was a lot of things happening 
with our former house, the house of Mizrahi. And Gillette and I, you know, we were previously already leaders in the house of Mizrahi. So we already took on this role in leadership and these tasks already. So in Brazil, speaking with other icons and legends, you know, they encouraged me to kind of like move forward and, and start something new. And this was like 2019, 2020, or when was this? This is 2019, summer of 2019. And, um, you know, it really, seeing the Borm scene in Brazil and seeing all of that, like, it just was a, a whirlwind of things. What's happening back home in the U.S. with my house, seeing this new, fresh ballroom scene, like, in Brazil, it just gave me a feeling of something new. Mm -hmm. You know, seeing, a, and then, of course, in the community back home, you seeing all these new houses open, these new young leaders creating houses. It wasn't like I wanted to follow the train, but I felt like it was my time to also be a part of that, you know? Yeah. And like, who else would I pick to be like my partner in crime, like to be my friend, to be, you know, someone who I can trust with this as well. It was Gillette, you know, we already built this relationship for so many years in the house of Ms. Rahi. And I just, you know, I know her leadership. I know her strong hand where I'm a little soft. <laughs> At the end, <laughs> mother knows best. And that's something that I even am still learning. You know what I'm saying? Mother's knows best. And, um, you know, I have to cherish that and, and her opinion and what she says and what she has to offer to the house. So it was a perfect marriage of our, you know, our spirits, our work ethic, our minds, you know, our ideas, our creative passion. So, and, and I think we both wanted to see, you know, artists like, in ballroom, emerge in ballroom and be a part of ballroom. We're both artists, you know, so um, we kind of wanted to birth that type of ballroom scene in that type of house. This is actually a small question. Uh, Gillette, do you identify as a butch queen? So with me, it's whatever I wake up and feel like. <laughs> <laughs> it's, very, it's very Madonna with me. That's why it's Gillette. It's whatever I wake up and feel like. But most of my um, Demeter, my persona, is she, her. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I was asking because I, you know, I haven't talked about talk to anyone about this on the show yet, but uh, the difference in being a, a, a butch queen mother than, than a fifth queen mother, which I think there are differences in, in what that means, particularly within this community, and sort of a founding mother. I, I was going to ask you a little about your thoughts about that and, and, and doing that within, within this house. There is a difference. I think most fifth queen mothers are looked at mostly as like the trophy mother or the easygoing mother, and she may nurture here and there versus the butch queen mother. I can only speak for myself. I statement, I am a stern set. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm only that way is because I was raised that way and it gave great results in me and my brothers and sisters. And I feel like it's my, I feel like it, I have a passion. I see something in you. And if I'm not on you, if I'm not stern on you, if I'm not like on you, on you, then my work is not getting done. Like, you know, so I guess it's a father mixed with mother in there just a little bit. But, you know, that's just my method of, you know, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> and how, has, how was that sort of like um, in composing the, the group that went on Legendary and then all, obviously sort of leading the group in particular? So um, I was definitely mother on the show, <laughs> uh, <laughs> behind the scenes. Um, at the end of the day, me and Amari, we're a partnership. I can't leave him out there, just do all the work. And there were times where I had to have his back. Sometimes where, <laughs> sometimes where I had to play the step up and step back, you know. Um, sometimes people don't want to hear you keep yelling at them. So let's hear from someone else. So I would, you know, step in and do my job. I'm not just there to just stand. I'm there to still be a mother on the show and off the show. So, yeah. And I, I was still handling business off the show, too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like, although the show has to paint one person as a parent, as parental figure, like in our scenario, having both founding parents on the show, we really tried not to go that direction. Like G Gillette was a complete mother. She wasn't a member of the house. She was, she played her part as being a mother and doing a lot of work, you know what I'm saying? And keeping me <laughs> like stress-free as well too. And, like it was, it was a process. And again, like I wouldn't have done the show without Gillette coming on the show. Like there was no way. So 
Omari, I have known you and of your clips for some time now. I have seen you at OTA a few times. And I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you became the voguer that you are today and just talk about sort of, you know, your career in the scene. Um, I started off voguing back in uh, 2004. Actually, the first ball that I was supposed to go to, I couldn't make it because I had to go back home to Senegal, to Africa. But my friends, when I came back to the States, my friends in high school, they showed me the DVD. Um, it was the POCC ball. I saw a pony and Deshaun walk. And that was the first time I saw voguing. That was the first time I saw dramatics. And instantly I kind of like fell in love with the style, fell in love with the culture. Um, at that time I was finding, you know, myself, my sexuality and things like that. So um, as a performer, already as a dancer already i gravitated to that specific um category so of course you know i i went to the clubs <laughs> i rebelled and stayed out late and you know did what i'd snuck out the house and went to the karate club in harlem you know and that's when i really started to started to like embody myself into the community i had friends you know we would kiki we would have uh, kiki sessions and things like that and vogue down in the house but the karate club is where I got to like perform. It was a stage for me, but it was also a place where I can be honestly gay. I can be me, you know? Um, but that's how I found, that's how I found ballroom. That's how I fell in love with ballroom. It was definitely the ballroom scene that kind of took me to a, a different point in my life where I needed to see myself more confident in my dancing and in my, in taking my profession seriously. Um, and taking my career seriously. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an African dancer. That's why I started off doing was African dance. Um, but it's it's African dance and voguing is like two different things. It's definitely on a different scale of each other. Mm -hmm. So to find a way where I can be Usman and I can be Omari and I can feel okay with being both of them, you know, because they live separate lives for a long time. They did live separate lives. But Again, finding myself and really sticking to like who I am as an African black man and a gay African black man, you know, and being ballroom, everything like that. I had to just find a way to merge my African dance, my voguing, so then I can find a way to merge Usman and Amari. And that's how I made my career. When you look back over your career, specifically in ballroom, is there a moment that you feel like was maybe a defining moment on the floor or that you go back to, or even that like people talk about? I have one moment that we're going to talk about, but I would love to hear a moment from you. I have a lot of moments, memories. <laughs> um, one of my favorite ones that actually I think someone just reminded me of was a time that I battled Alora mm -hmm. in pink and white. Although I didn't win that category, that that battle, because I battled Alora, because I was a, a new person on the scene battling Alora, it still was an impactful moment for me and for a lot of, you know, generations of dramatics coming after that. Um, I battled a lot of legends, actually, throughout my career in Borm scene. Um, my battle with Ricky Alora as well was something that uh, people was like, what? And I won that battle. And it was really, um, it was a blessing and an honor because I love Ricky. You know, that was in uh, VA. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, there's a lot of moments, a lot of memories that I remember. The, every latex ball is a moment for me. <laughs> the latex ball is my stage. I, f I feel like I own that stage every time. Just for people who don't know, can you talk a little bit about the importance of Alora specifically for dramatics? She is, I mean, she is the mother to me of dramatics, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Personally, that was my auntie. You know, I've, I've spent nights with her talking she inspired me a lot to just be myself to find my own kind of dramatics and let it be like don't don't try to you have don't think you have to be someone else like be you wherever that is is you like she told me to embrace the african movements and and find a way to find that in my vogue mm -hmm. so she definitely is an inspiration to all dramatics honestly like her personality her spontaneous movements like her character the story she would tell like she was a good time you know saying when you watched her perform the moment that i think about i obviously think about a lot of moments that i've seen you but one that i always see going viral at least once a year uh i'm sure you've seen it is that kiki scene moment <laughs> i can see in your face that you know exactly what i'm talking about yeah <laughs> uh i i honestly okay i don't really like that clip Really? Do you want to do you want to explain it a little bit for people and then tell us why you don't like it? 
I don't, I don't like it because I don't, I don't ever want people to see me in that way. Right. Although mm-hmm. to people, it, it was a kiki. It was a moment for them. It was like, oh, wow. And, and granted, everyone's taking it for different things. For me personally, um, I'm a very humble person and I don't ever like to like show that type of side and stuff. And it was, I was doing it as a kiki as well. It still was a kiki to me, but I just was like, the person that I was talking to, the moment that it happened, the reason why it happened, I just was like, what? Wait a minute. How? The category, we already got our tens for the category. How am, how am I getting chopped in the middle of now the second part of the category? So we need to back up a little bit and just give people a little bit of, you know, what happened, right? Just in case you haven't seen it. Essentially, Omari's walking category within the Kiki scene, someone chops Omari and then Omari quite famously rejects the chop and and takes the, the mic and Vogue's and gets his tins anyways. It, it, you have to watch it to, to understand it, but just wanted to sort of paint a little bit of a picture of, of, of what that moment was like. Yeah, it was um, the category you had to get your tins for a creative crown. So, you know, we had to get your... <laughs> so, you know... I personally came with a bunch of different crowns that also my other uh, Juicy members, House of Juicy Couture members wore, and we all got our tents for those crowns. You know, a lot of people didn't have creative crowns, so, you know, the judges were chopping. So they did a tens where everyone had to come and get their tents separately for the crown. They weren't doing that at first. At first, you just were getting your tents voguing, and they would, you know, judge, but a lot of people were getting chopped. So we all got our tents, all the juiciest. We got our tents for our crowns. So when we had to vogue, I didn't understand getting chopped because we just got our tents for the crowns. So why are you chopping me in this segment of the uh, the category? Right. So um, I think that's where the rage or the conversation really started to happen. It was just was like I felt like it was catty. Like that was what. And I could understand. I could understand you chopping me if you felt again that my outfit wasn't worth the amount that the category was held for. I can send you chopping me for that, but then you should have chopped me in the beginning, in the beginning. Simple as that. I can take a chop. That is not a problem. I can take a chop. Um, but as, as you know, you had to make, it wasn't valid for me. It wasn't valid. You should have chopped me when you were giving me tens for crowns if you felt my outfit wasn't um, worth the category. And I would have took it. So Gillette, Omari was just talking about the latex ball, and I encountered you for the first time at a latex ball. We talked about this before. Um, you were walking against Jao Milan. I thought that you were walking amazing, and then there was that moment with the scarf. Can you paint us that picture and, and just talk to me a little bit about sort of your career walking runway um, within ballroom? Um so we'll start at that moment. Um, <laughs> that was a latex ball. Um, the category was basically like you were in Egypt, you was trapped in a pyramid, and what did you bring out? So I brought out the Mew Cat. And at first I was a little nervous because that was my first time ever like feeling that exposed, like a little naked walking um, runway at a ball. Weren't you like in like full body suit or body paint? My body suit. Yeah, I was in full body paint and just just a couple little, you know, shields and things on me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um I was a little nervous, but I did it anyway. That's why I came out from the side. I was like if they're going to chop me, don't chop me from the back. You can just chop me from the side, girl, so I can just keep on walking on to the back down the stairs. But um As I was walking from the side and, you know, Deshaun was amping it up and he was like, is this Gillette? And they was getting in. They was, you know, I started going. And then after that, that's actually where Jack gave me Gillette the Threat, right? right? The name Gillette the Threat. So I was like, okay, girl. So like, it's it's, it's cute. Let's get it. Um, I was watching Jow the whole night and I was like, if they let this girl beat me in these heels, which you are not supposed to wear heels (laughs) when you walk in Butch Queen runway, I'm going to be upset. But I just... It was just like an energy, an essence that I felt like when I was walking. Like when I started walking and then I saw the scarf come, I was like, girl, either you're going to fall or you're going to catch it. So I caught it and it went from there. And I was like, well, give it back to her. So I threw it back in her face. So when you say you you saw the scarf come for people who haven't seen the clip, Jal sort of throws the, not sort of, Jal throws the scarf in front of Gillette to be shady, to like, you know, block her and make her maybe fall on it or something. And you caught it in midair and like put it on, I think, for a little while. 
No, I kind of threw it over my shoulder. It's very like the pharaohs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then later on, right before the battle ended, threw it back. Yes. And you won that battle. Yes, I did. I won the, um, won the whole category. <laughs> right. And so can you talk to me a little about sort of like how you got into runway and ballroom and, and just your career? So um, I've always been a creative, artsy kind of person, like to myself. You ask my mom, she'll be like, he's always in his room, just listen to music, do what he does. But um, I actually got into J setting first. I'm from the South. I'm from North Carolina. Um, we're very heavy on, you know, like majorette dancing, step, all those kind of things. So I was a J set girl and that's what we were doing the clubs. But one night it was raining really bad. The club was closed and um, my gay mother who is now deceased and I have a new gay mother. I'm sorry, but I have my gay mother who's now deceased. Um, she was heavy into ballroom and she was like, I'm going to a ball. She was just running around the house, just asking me for like this and that. And I'm like, well, girl, you could take it. Um, but her car wouldn't start. So I drove her to the ball. The ball was in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And, um, I pretty much went to the ball. I didn't know what was going on. I paid $25. And at that time I'm a college student. And if I pay something like, I might as well enjoy. So I have walked <laughs> Get your money's worth. <laughs> yeah. So um I have I had walked every category. I had on like this light, this loud lime green shirt and this lime green socks and these pink shorts and stuff. Very feeling like I was an AKA. I was in college, leave me alone. <laughs> So I was walking everything. I walked Best Dress, I got chopped. I walked Virgin Vogue, I got chopped. And then when it came to Virgin Runway, um, I was just walking normal. And just like the way I walk is just my normal walk. I mean, when I walk balls, I'll just amp it up just a little bit, but it's just my natural sway. So when I walked, they gave me my tens and they was like standing to the side. So I was like, okay, this is cute. And then I went on and battled everyone. I won Virgin Runway. And then my gay mother came to me. She was like, girl, you know, you can start walking with the Europeans now. So I went out there. It was open to all. I walked that, won that. And so I had did that for like six months. You're not supposed to do that in ballroom. But I had did that for like a couple <laughs> couple months. And so I met my gay father, Dominique, um, the legendary Dominique Revlon, took me under his wing. He really didn't have to show or teach me much. I met him and um, Boogie Revlon. And their thing was this like, girl, just slow down. So they really helped me with slowing down my runway. And it just went from there. Like, they just took me to the right balls, you know, helped me out. And in North Carolina, it was it was cute. I was a legend slayer. You're a legend now, right? Yes. Was there a moment sort of, you know, on the road to becoming a legend that was really important for you or, or that you look back at or a moment that you were like, no, they're they're going to deem me like it's going to happen? Uh, well, my most favorite moment, and I think the moment that really made me is um, at Nemo Mizrahi's ball. It was the old school versus the new school. I pretty much set all the legends of North Carolina. And so that's like one of my most favorite. Everyone would think it's probably the latex, the cat, but no, that's my most favorite. Because those were the girls like your Dominique's, your Junie Milan's, your Jonathan's and uh, Father Tony's and Andre's, all of them. Like they were all on the team and I had to save my team. And like, that's my most favorite moment. Omari, I know you do a lot of work outside the scene as well. Uh, I know you are about to do a performance with Works in Progress at the Guggenheim or recently did one, right? I, uh... Recently did one. Recently. And I, I went to a preview, but that was like a while ago. But I, I know you recently did one and then you're, you know, you have your dance company and you're developing your own dance style. And so can you talk to me a little bit about that work outside the scene and also what it's like to develop your own dance style? <laughs> um, first and foremost, I I really enjoy creating space for you know, for artists who you don't normally see in these institutions, you know, you don't really, really see, get the chance to be in those roles, right? Of, of directorial roles. They're always in the background or a specialty. And, you know, being a part of the LGBT community, being a part of the Borm community, uh, you see a lot of youth that come into the community that's like, that they have a lot of talent, they want to perform. So the company, you know, it, it's about diversity. It's about, you know, allowing 
people from the LGBT community, people from the born community who are artists to um, have space to, to share the stories, to dance, to perform, and to hopefully from this company grow into something else, you know, move on to their own um, directorial roles and things like that. I'm a director in the company, but I'm not the only choreographer. So everyone in the company is allowed to put in their input and creative uh, aspects and things like that. So it's it's really... It's a beautiful thing, and I'm actually hosting auditions soon because I'm looking to bring in more people from the Bournemouth community, specifically looking for more trans women who dance and are looking to go into that professional field and bring them into the company and uh, and see what we can do from there. Works in process has been a blessing. You know, they have been investors and supporters of the company and what we are about. So I'm I'm looking forward to this partnership with them and hopefully uh, some other institutions that I have working <laughs> working under my sleeve. Uh, but I have a lot of projects coming up that I want to involve the ballroom community and will help us, you know, see all the talent that's in the community. So, And Gillette, I know you're also doing things outside of the scene. So can you talk to me a little bit about sort of where ballroom has been able to take you and, and not, you know, just ballroom taking you, but like your talent and skill has taken you within the scene? Um, so yes, um, ballroom has taken me international. I am a international runway instructor. I am currently the only one that is teaching runway internationally. Not only just with ballroom giving me that, I guess this is my God-given talent, um, but being able to teach and to break it down for people to better understand. I actually now I'm doing it vir virtually. So I am teaching online. I feel like there's a few other, maybe Twiggy. I think Twiggy still teaches, right? Twiggy Pucci Garcon, I think she was just in Brazil. I don't remember when that was last year, I think. But I think COVID has stopped it. But I do think that there's, it's very few, particularly when you compare it to how many choreographies. Current. Got it. Got it. But did, was there anything else? I know you were talking a little bit about, like, you teach people also that are not necessarily, like, just for ballroom teaching, right? Like, you teach um, people outside the scene. Yeah, so um, I also teach persons outside the scene, like modeling troops, um, even private individual classes. Some women that just want to learn how to walk in heels or just be seductive for their for their spouse. Um, I teach those classes too. And also in those classes, I teach how to be confident, like within yourself. Like it's all in the walk. You can sell anything in your walk, love. So just be confident in yourself and It'll win. Look, Amari won. <laughs> uh, looking back at you guys' times on Legendary, what was your favorite moments individually? I'd love to start with Omari. Um, my favorite moment, honestly, was Tinseltown. Mm. That was like, it took us on a journey. I feel like we really, really performed strong as a house. Everyone got utilized in their you know, character and who they wanted to be. And, and everyone um, really performed. Like, I still watch it over and over again. Um, so that's definitely one of my favorites that I would have to say. Yeah. What about you, Gillette? I love Tinseltown too, but I think my favorite would be um, The Toys. Mm. It was very innovative. It was very different. And I think that's one of my happiest moments about being on the show. We wasn't like everyone else. Um, we really stepped outside the box. We gave you innovative stuff, different things. We may not have gave you acrobats or pushing people up or all those things like that. We actually gave you what was given, a stage, and we gave you a performance. Right. So having seen all the other houses, you know who's left. Here's my last question. Who do you guys think is going home next? Who is going home or should go home? Should go home next. Balenciaga. Balenciaga? Yeah, I would have to agree. I, I think, yeah, I would kind of have to say it's the Balenciaga's time to kind of go. I just feel like, you know, they're getting by. They're getting by with like slick little things. Like that that episode when it's when they talked about um, you know, the parent had to be best dressed overness. Like it was a nice concept and nice production, but like uh Shannon was not in a best dressed head to toe overness look. Mm. You know, especially not if it's especially in, in it's candy. Like you could have did some amazing things with candy and glass and all these things. And I don't think it it really hit for me. And there's other things too that's that's happened, um, slip ups that's happened in the show that I just feel like, you know, they should have never gotten. In the episode, obviously there's that moment between Honey and 
law and the judges and you sort of reacted to it on screen uh in the episode around sort of the shoe and the boot and and all that stuff but that was really interesting to have someone docked for you know essentially their attitude uh as it pertained to you know just just working in a professional environment really yeah when it's been happening the whole time yeah it just was like oh well now you dock yeah i think my question was a little bit did did you agree with with what the judges were saying around that, you know, about the idea of, of you know, at the end of the day, everybody's doing what they can to, to, to make these performances happen. And so it was, it was really interesting to have that conversation play out on, on the stage in that way. Um, Gillette? It's like this. When it comes to ballroom and it's like any, as a house production, and it's for any amount of a coin, they're looking for slip ups. They, they're they're okay with, you know, the routine or whatever storyline you're given, but they're looking for a wig to come off, a shoe to come off, someone to fall so they can chop you. So with all that being said, a lot of things was slid through. But if my house would have stood there and took their shoes off, or if I would have fell in my heels that I had just got before I walked out on the stage, or if Amari didn't land his dip, we would have got a three. Well, we will we will leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you guys so, so much for all of your time. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing both of you both in the scene and outside of it. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so, so much to the entrepreneurial founding parents, Omari Orici and Gillette Orici. Their house may be young, but their legacy will last forever. Now it's time for the let out moment where I pick the snippet of the show that will be stuck in my head for the foreseeable future. This week, it was the teachable moment for me. After what was a really solid performance, the House of Balenciaga stood in line to get their scores. When asked if something was wrong, Honey told the panel of judges that essentially she didn't like her boots. Quite a number of the judges commented on what she said, but the loudest, as always, was one Law Roach. Temperatures got a little heated, so let's revisit the exchange. And I'll see you here next week on The Let Out. But what I will say, what I didn't like the most is, honey, we all know that you are a superstar, right? But the biggest and the greatest thing you can do as a superstar is remain humble. And I am from wardrobe. I am a stylist. So that little mark you read about these ugly ass shoes turned me off from you because it's teams back there that work their ass off to help you guys create your looks every week. So don't do that. Oh, thank you. And thank you. Team. Everybody's it's doing something. Everybody's working hard. And a real star shine. And part of the biggest part of shining is being kind to people. I would die. I would die if one of if one of my people I dress got on a stage like this and, and, and made a comment about that. So for me, because of that comment, I'm gonna give y'all a seven. That's, That's real, real bitch shit. That's real bitch shit. The Let Out is produced by HBO Max in partnership with Spoke Media. Make sure to stream episodes of Legendary and The Let Out on HBO Max and tell us all your thoughts about the departure of the House of Orici over at Legendary Max on Instagram. I'm your host, Michael Street. You can find me at Michael Street on Instagram. For Spoke Media, our producers are Kelly Kauf and Ariel Mejia, with help from Hebron Mendez, Alicia Force, Brigham Mosley, Janielle Kastner, and myself. Original music and sound design by Evan Arnett. Special thanks to Clay Kim. Executive producers are Aliyah Tavakolian and Keith Reynolds. See you next time. <laughs>